May 4th movement is one of the greatest intellectual movements in the history of modern China. It started with the demonstration of the students of Peking uh, against the Japanese government's humiliating policy towards China. Though it was started by the youth and students, it is not that only youth and students were the only participants. And in fact, it was a broad social movement where not only the middle class intellectuals and students, but many other uh, groups and classes also uh, played an important role. This movement is associated with a particular year. There is no doubt about it. That is 1919. Actually, it embraced a broader period. Uh, and it is said that it started roughly from 1917 and continued up to 1921. And this was a broad period of much social ferment and intellectual revolution. And it was definitely an important part of the cultural process, which started roughly from the days when China came into contact with the Western powers. Since the entry of foreign capitalism into China, Chinese society underwent a transformation. The society which was feudal in character now got itself transformed into a semi-feudal and semi-colonial society. There was a change in the Chinese agriculture, no doubt about it. Then industries also developed in the second half of the 19th century. Those industries were large-scale industries where Chinese big bourgeoisie took an active part and they were very much collaborators with uh, foreign capitalists. Now, despite the fact that there was some development of Chinese industries, those industries could not expand very much. And it was only during the period of the First World War that there was some scope for the development of China's national industry. There was a difference between the industries that developed in the early 20th century and the industries that developed in the late 19th century. The late 19th century industries were mostly large-scale industries, heavy industries, whereas the industries that developed in the first half of the 20th century or during the period of the First World War, these were light industries or middle-sized industries. And these were called national industries, no doubt about it. And in fact, it was this First World War that gave some breathing space uh, to the Chinese national industries. And apart from industries, uh, modern banks also developed. Uh, and But the fact is that if we consider the total requirement of the Chinese society, then uh, that was the development was very, uh, very insignificant uh, in proportion to the demand. And then after the end of the First World War again, foreign capital again came into China. And so the industries that developed by taking advantage of the breeding period because of the, because of the war, war situation. Now, these industries also uh, came to be confronted with uh, new challenge, foreign challenge. Uh, now, apart from these economic changes that took place, some social changes also took place in Chinese society. There was a peculiar balance in Chinese society. Uh, a social equilibrium is there, was there. Uh, on the one hand, there were uh, the military officials. On the other hand, we have the landlords and the gentry, landowning gentry or office holding gentry stood in between the two. Now that was a balance. That was a balance in China. Now that balance uh, was destroyed as a result of new developments that had been taking place over the years, over the decades. And in fact, there was an the emergence of new social classes, new intellectuals who uh, were influenced by Western learning. Then the bourgeois, the national, the capitalist class was there. And side by side, we have the working class also. Another important development was that there was a creation of a huge, a massive peasantry. Peasantry who were thrown out of work who became landless as a result of the concentration of landed wealth in fewer and fewer hands because of the agrarian crisis, because of the changing circumstances. And it was this roaming population uh, which uh, 
one section of this roaming population, uh, they joined landlords as mercenary soldiers. And another section, they became bandits. They became rebels, rebels against the existing order. Now, it was this roaming, this section which joined as mercenary soldiers, they sustained warlordism in China. Warlords were landlords, no doubt about it, but they always fought against one another to extend their spheres of influence. And this warlordism developed to a large extent during the period of the May 4th movement. And side by side, as we have pointed out, there, that there, was a, there were the new intellectuals. And it was these new intellectuals who, who uh, realized that uh, foreign encroachment had been doing much harm to the Chinese society, Chinese economy. And so they raised a safe China crusade, that China must be protected from foreign encroachment. That was one thing. Another thing was that they were very much critical of Confucian ideology, because Confucian ideology was the ideology which gave sustenance to the Chinese feudalism, and it had also sustained Chinese slavery in the uh, ancient period. And in fact, the May 4th movement was the culmination of the activities of all these forces together. In the long history of China, there are many events which, uh, which uh, bore some resemblance to the May 4th movement. The first event where the Chinese village students took an active part in politics can be dated back to 542 BC. See, that is the first recorded history in, of China where when uh, students took an active part and when the village students they criticized government policies. That was the beginning. And from then on, there were many events in the ancient history of China, in the medieval history of China, where students had been very much active and they even demanded the removal of the governor, provincial governors, etc. Despite the fact that Chinese students throughout history took an active part in political affairs, in movements, Chao Se Sung, as he said, it was unique, both in breadth of activity as also in the depth of significance. The intellectuals of the May 4th movement, uh, they realized the truth that if China was to stand on its own feet, then she should be made free from foreign control, from foreign encroachment. And in fact, after the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95 and the signing of the another humiliating treaty, the Treaty of Shimonoseki, 1895, this uh, Save China rallying cry, crusade, it developed and it was started by the intellectuals. On 18 January 1915, the Japanese minister to China, uh, Hiyoki Eki, he presented the infamous 21 demands to uh, President Wan Shi Kai, who was the president at that time. If the Chinese government accepted the 21 demands, major portions of the Chinese territory would come under the control of Japan. It had several sections, but there was a fifth group of demands that had most uh, serious implications, which was at first concealed from public eyes, from the people. And if that was, that a fifth group of demands was accepted by one Shikai's government, it would mean that China would come under the control of Japan. Now, uh, so uh, a tussle had been going on. Yuan Shikai had no option, no other option but to accept it. But then there was discussions and etc. On 7th May, uh, Japan gave an ultimatum uh, to China. Either you accept the 21 demands or you face the consequences. And it, of course, meant uh, Japanese aggression uh, on against China. And so after two years, on 9th May, Yuan Shikai's government accepted the 21 demands. And when these became, it was, uh, the news came out and it made, it was became, it became public. There was a huge public outcry against the 21 demands, against the acceptance of the 21 demands. And the two days, 7th May and 9th May, were denounced as uh, uh, days of national humiliation 
or for China. And it was believed that it was the, the Yuan Shikai's government, it surrendered to Japanese pressure. Xiao Se-sung points out that uh, the acceptance of the 21 demands had had two important effects. First, there was a growth of new nationalism in China. Many came to realize that in order to resist foreign aggression, China must be unified. There should be a national unity uh, within the Chinese people. In fact, this feeling was reflected in a slogan, externally resist the foreigners. The second development was that a national unity also developed, where people from various walks of life joined hands. This nationalist zeal uh, played a major role in the mass movements that developed uh, in, in China, in many parts of China, in the days that followed, in the months that followed. On 19 February 1915, a, citizen, a Citizens Patriotic Society was formed to oppose the 21 demands. And then on 18th March, same year, a National Association of Comrades Against Japan was formed. It was formed in Shanghai, where workers played an important role, and they started a movement for the boycott of Japanese goods. And this rising uh, anti-Japanese tide alarmed Japan. Japan put pressure on Wan Shikai to give an order to abandon the boycott, but that was of no avail. And so the boycott continued for months and it definitely affected Japanese external trade. Now, there are other factors also which uh, uh, contributed to the rise of this intellectual revolution. That was the role played by the Chinese students who had been studying abroad. In fact, Chinese students were there in the USA, in Japan, in France. In USA, the most important Japanese student, Japanese intellectual in uh, studying in the USA was Hu uh, The most important uh, Chinese intellectual studying in France was Chen Tu Siu. And intellectual studying in Japan was Lu Sun. Lu Sun was acclaimed as a Maxim Gorky of China because of his writings. It has been pointed out by Emmanuel Su that these new intellectuals, say, uh, they belong to a transitional period. They were also well acquainted with Western civilization, as also with Chinese classics. They were fairly well known among the Chinese people, and they commanded also respect among the literary uh, sections of the Japanese society. And they call for a critical evaluation of the national heritage. And they also uh, advocated that there should be, that, that the Chinese people also have something uh, to learn from the West. Both they were critical of the national heritage, as also they felt the need of uh, taking something from Western learning. And it was these intellectuals, these ideas, which uh, played an important role in the uh, May 4th movement. From 1903 to 1919, 41% of the students studied in Japan, 33% in the USA, and 24% in Europe, particularly France. Now, in the USA, when the uh, news of the 21 demands reached, there was an, uh, much resentment among the Chinese students. There was a debate among the Chinese students about what their course of action should be. Uh, one section of the students that demanded that China should immediately declare war on Japan because it was very much humiliating. But there was another section which was represented by Hu Shi, who was the most important, one of the most important intellectuals during the stage of the May 4th movement. Now, Hu Shi actually was not in favor of any war against Japan. What he wanted was to bring about a, an intellectual revolution, a literary revolution. He actually was talking about writing poems in prose diction. So he was in favor of a uh, literary revolution rather than a political revolution. 
that was uh, Fushi. Now, uh, in Japan, uh, we we have the actual the revolutionary core of the Chinese students. Lu Sun was there. Uh, he was uh, possibly for most intellectual figure, not only during the May 4th movement, but also after, as he was compared to the uh, to Maxim Gorky. Uh, and it was the Chinese students studying in Japan who uh, supplied the revolutionary elements, the most militant po sections of the Chinese students had been studying in Japan. Then we have France, Chen Tuxiu had been in France, and so he was also influenced by the French Revolution, French Enlightenment. So these ideas were there. And all these people, they returned to China after 1915, sometime or in the same year, because all of them felt that they have something to do rather than studying abroad. One important development of the uh, May 4th movement was that uh, it was a change in the Chinese language. Actually, by Chinese, there is no alphabet. It was there are ideograms, there are pictures, there are characters. The Chinese characters are there, but there are no Chinese alphabet. And that is the reason why uh, Chinese language is the most difficult language. The Chinese written language was totally different from the spoken language. So uh, people felt, the intellectuals felt the, felt the need to, uh, to bring about a situation where the colloquial speech could could come closer to the written language. It was felt by the typing rebels earlier, mid 19th century, and it was definitely felt by uh, the intellectuals of the May 4th movement. And, uh, in, and in this field, Lu Sun and Mao Tun, they, they played important role. Now, Anyway, uh, after the presentation of the 21 demands, uh, the Chinese students, as we have pointed out, came back uh, to China. And Chen Tuxiu founded a magazine, uh, which was known as the New Youth, which played an important role in the May 4th movement. And since the political situation was very difficult, uh, Chen Tuxiu avoided direct uh, political uh, commitments. It was a deliberate avoidance of direct political commitments. The purpose of the magazine was declared to be the reformation of thought and behavior of the youth, rather than the launching of political criticism. Hu Xi, however, thought in a different way. Hu Xi felt that we should concentrate on academic, educational, and literary fields rather than in, in the political field. Chen Tuxiu felt that we should look deeper than this because we should look into the root of the problem and that there should be a socio-political transformation. Unless there is a socio-political transformation, uh, there could not be any change. At the beginning of 1917, uh, the literary movement uh, started to take shape. There was another development which helped uh, in the whole process. It was on 26 December 1916 that a person called Sai Wan Pei, he was elected the Chancellor of the University of Peking. Now, Sai Wan Pei was a former member of Sun Yat-sen's organization, Revolutionary Brotherhood, Tung Menghui. He joined Peking University as a chancellor. And after his joining the University of Peking, the intellectual movement gained a momentum. He was a political person, no doubt about it. He was also an intellectual. But he introduced some innovations in the University of Peking, which is very important, uh, which is generally not seen nowadays. His idea was that since he was a chancellor, it was he who took decisions, but he made it clear that at the time of selection of faculty members, he 
would not be influenced by his own political ideology. He would only go by merit, academic merit. And that was a system which he introduced. And the result was that teachers, having different political ideologies, they joined University of Peking. So we have not, not only the intellectuals, new intellectuals, but also intellectual, old intellectuals, that is, who are influenced by Confucian ideology, other ideologies of other types, not the new ones. So uh, University of Peking became the center where intellectuals having different outlooks could gather together. And so that helped in, the, in a, an interaction, interaction, discussion, conflicts, ideological contradictions among them. And so the university uh, actually became a public forum for debates between all conservative scholars and the new intellectuals. So both these groups confronted uh, each other. It is quite natural that both these groups should uh, come up with their own periodicals. There should be some mouthpiece. And in 1918, a group of students in Peking, they established a journal, New Tide. New Tide or the Renaissance. And it had three guiding principles, critical spirit, scientific thinking, and reformed rhetoric. And the first issue of the magazine was dated 1st January 1919. This journal was immediately welcomed by the new literati, new youth and students, new intellectuals. The articles that were published in the journal showed the influence of the October Revolution. In the first issue, there was an important article uh, written by one Lo Chia Lun, who wrote that in world history, almost every significant period had had its tide that could not be stopped. Then he said that Renaissance was the tide after the Dark Ages, and Reformation was the tide of 16th century Europe. And in the 20th century, it is the Russian Revolution. These are the tides. Very important events, landmarks, watersheds in the history of the world. Chao Se Sung, while referring to these events, to these articles, he, say, uh, he points out that it does not mean that all the students had become Marxists or communists. No. Uh, there were some Marxists, there were some pro-Bolshevik elements, no doubt. But it was a mixture of Marxism and democracy, Western democracy. There was a mixture. The idea was taking shape, particularly because of the October Revolution. But it was on the process of taking shape. So we have on one side a new tide, new tide society, and a new tide journal. And on the other side, we have the national heritage, uh, which was started by old conservative intellectuals. The name itself suggests the national heritage. And it advocated the traditional literary language and style, uh, Confucianism, Confucian morality, old ethics, etc. And so there was a conflict, there was a uh, discussion, uh, uh, one view refuted by another, and then counter. Uh, counter views, etc. So these have been going on. So, and in this way, the new ideas developed. New ideas could develop only by fighting against old ideas. So this was very essential, and this was definitely uh, Sai Wan Pei definitely played an important role in uh, converting this movement into a uh, into an intellectual movement. And this new movement also received enthusiastic support from the young intellectuals. Uh, in every newspaper, periodical, there is a letters to the editor column. And numerous letters were published in a new tight journal, uh, uh, which were written by the young people, mostly by the young people, uh, pe people who, be, who later became prominent in the history of China. Many of them joined the Communist Party 
Many of them took an active role in the communist movement, revolutionary movement. And uh, from 1917, a number of other societies also sprang up. As for example, the New People's Study Society, which was founded by Mao Zedong in Hunan, Mao's own creation, New People's Study Society. Then in Tianjin, we have the Awakening Society, formed by Chou Enlai. Among other societies, we can also mention the names of the Society for Literary Research, the Creation Society, the Spinners of Wars, the Christian Society, etc. Gradually, however, this movement developed into, or the intellectuals, the, there was a division among the intellectuals in the sense that there were rightists and leftists among the new intellectuals, not old. The old was there, no doubt about it. But among the new intellectuals also, we have a right wing and a left wing. Right wing rep represented by Hu Xi, left wing represented by Mao Zedong. And the right wing, they were not interested in politics. Hu Xi and others and his associates, they were interested in, lit in literary revolution or other things. Uh, whereas Mao and his associates, they of course believed that unless there were basic socio-economic transformation, uh, uh, China would remain the same. So in order to bring about fundamental transformation in China, there should be a social revolution. And the idea of social revolution, socio-political revolution, dethroning the existing society, an anti-feudal and of course anti-imperialist revolution, that started to take shape from that period. There is no, double, no doubt about it. The May 4th movement was a broad intellectual movement which was part of a long process, a long cultural process. It had much to do with the coming of the Western powers. Uh, this May 4th movement was directed both against the existing uh, conservative ideas within Chinese society. And it was also against foreign control. It was opposing foreign control, but it was also ready to take lessons from Western, from the West. They were not ready to accept Western control. They raised the slogan of Save China Crusade. They, would, they were prepared to take what was good in the West, but definitely they would oppose what was bad in the Western civilization. 